My name is George Walker, and I am a deacon here, as Jeff said at the beginning. And this is the second in a series of sermons entitled, Get Ready, uh, based on the book of Joshua. And before we get into it, I want to ask a question. How many of us have seen a hornet's nest? Hanging there from a tree, looking like a football in a party dress, buzzing, stinging denizens. All right, now how many had to learn a hard way what that was? Okay. Now the rest of us, luckily, were given some guidance about don't touch it, don't poke it with a stick, don't throw rocks at it, don't even get close to it, right? What do you call that? What do you call that kind of guidance where somebody tells you, don't do it, don't do this thing? All right, think about this, ponder on it, meditate on it, if you will, and we'll come back to it a little bit later. But let's begin now with a prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, it is a joy and a sobering burden to stand before your people, and I pray that you would use my interests, my abilities, my preparation, my life experience, and the words I'm trying to say, and transform them into your words. Open our hearts by the power of your Spirit, and now May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. The text this morning is in Joshua chapter 1, verses 7 through 9. And it goes, Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left that you may be successful wherever you go. Do not let this book of the law depart from your mouth. Meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be terrified. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. We'll notice some things right off with this text, and that is there's some repetition going on. And the Lord doesn't say anything that he doesn't mean, and he doesn't repeat it if it isn't important. So it is important that Joshua be strong and courageous in in what's about to happen. Now, Joshua is a person who has already proven himself, has shown himself to be strong and courageous. When the Israelites were camped in the wilderness in the valley of Rephidim and the Amalekites attacked them, Moses said to Joshua, take some men and go fight the Amalekites. And he defeated them in battle. When Moses went up on the mountain at Sinai and it was quaking and the sound of trumpets and there was this cloud like billowing out of a furnace and a consuming fire on the top of it and people were scared out of their wits, Joshua went up the mountain with Moses. And when Moses sent spies into Canaan to see how the land lay, there were 12 of them and 10 came back with the majority report that said, it's a great place, but the people there are too big for us to fight. And Joshua and Caleb said, the Lord is with us. Let's do it. He'll give it to us. These people are bread for us. So Joshua has been courageous, but much of that was some years in the past. And it's absolutely true that we need to exercise the graces that we've been given, the gifts that we have, or they're going to weaken. And so that could be a part of it. Joshua needs to be exercising his courageousness. But another part of it is that the situation has changed now. Moses isn't there anymore. Moses, the Lord's servant, is dead. And Joshua is the man now. And that's a different situation. And also, this is more than military conquest going on. Yes, that's a big part of what Joshua is about to do and what the people are about to do. But there's something more. There is the founding of a new nation. 
this crowd of slaves come out of Egypt, wandered around in the wilderness because they didn't listen to the minority report from Joshua and Caleb and spent 40 years in the wilderness until an entire generation passed away. They're about to go in now. And that's going to be the fulfillment of a promise to their great, 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 many great grandfather, Abraham. And when God called Abram, he said to him, I'm going to make your descendants a great nation. And he said more than that, too. He said, and I'm going to bless you, and your descendants are going to be a blessing to the world. Abram was blessed to be a blessing. This nation is going to be blessed to be a blessing. And I hope you can see it coming. We have been blessed to be a blessing. So, a big job for Joshua. And this nation is not just any nation, and it's not in just any place. Because God chose the time, and God chose the place, and God chose the people, and he chose this place in the crossroads of the trading paths from Africa to Asia to Europe, and right there in the middle of it is this place that he's going to give to these slaves to make a nation. And they're going to be a special nation to him. As, it, as Moses explained in Exodus 19.6, they're going to be a nation of priests, a holy nation. They're going to be a special nation. They're going to be an example to the world. And they're going to have blessings, to be sure. But their blessings are not because of their own merit. Their blessings are so they can be a blessing to all the nations. And so they're going to be a light to the world, if you will. They're going to be a moral standard in the world where people matter, where it doesn't matter if you're a foreigner or a woman or a child, what your status might be in some other nation. In this, in this nation, you're going to be somebody. How many of you use Our Daily Bread as a devotional? Uh, there's... Uh, Copies out on the Welcome Center if, you have, if you're not raising your hand now. Okay. Um, last week, or about a week ago, September 6th, the reading uh, accompanied a devotional where a, the writer talked about her husband and herself helping some Vietnamese neighbors move an old fence that somebody was giving away down the block. And the reading from that was from Leviticus. It was Leviticus chapter 19, verses 9 to 18. And I want you to hear those because this is a part of what this nation is going to be. It says, When you reap the harvest of your land, do not reap to the very edges of your field or gather the gleanings of your harvest. Do not go over your vineyard a second time or pick up the grapes that have fallen. Leave them for the poor and the alien. I am the Lord your God. Do not steal. Do not lie. Do not deceive one another. Do not swear falsely by my name. And so profane the name of your God. I am the Lord. Do not defraud your neighbor or rob him. Do not hold back the wages of a hired man overnight. Do not curse the deaf or put a stumbling block in front of the blind. But fear your God. I am the Lord. Do not pervert justice. Do not show partiality to the poor or favoritism to the great, but judge your neighbor fairly. Do not go about spreading slander among your people. Do not do anything that endangers your neighbor's life. I am the Lord. Do not hate your brother in your heart. Rebuke your neighbor frankly so you will not share in his guilt. Do not seek revenge or bear a grudge against one of your people, but love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. This is the nation they're founding. And Joshua is going to be the leader of it. And he needs strength and he needs courage because when you're leading a bunch of people, they can pluck your last nerve. 
And Moses was like that. He says, Lord, how long am I going to have to put up with his people? The raw material Joshua has to work with here has a lot of work to be done on it. And so Joshua needs to be strong and courageous in facing that task. And not only that, he needs to be careful to obey. And that's said twice as well. And be careful there as to, to put a guard on it, to put a hedge around it, to be alert and diligent, to be aware of your surroundings so that you would be able to do everything that God says. Because there's going to be many stumbling blocks to it. So guard yourself. And the promise there is repeated as well so that you may be successful. Now, what kind of success is this? Is this success in the eyes of the world? I don't think so. This is the Lord talking to Joshua, and when he says that you will be successful, that means successful in the eyes of the Lord. And what does the Lord mean when he says, I want you to be successful? He doesn't mean wealthy. He doesn't mean mega church with lots of members. He means that you make right decisions, that you be intelligent about your choices, that you guide your life by his instruction. That's what the Lord means when you're successful. When you do the right things, that means you're successful. How that's measured by somebody else, that really doesn't matter. For the Lord, it's sticking to the plan. That's how you're successful. And now, if you've been looking at how the text was structured today, we have calls to be strong and courageous at the beginning and the end. And we have calls to be careful to obey so that you may be successful right before and after those. And right in the middle of this sandwich, the meat, if you will, is the part about the law and what we're going to do with it. And so... The word that was read in Joshua, law, is the Hebrew word Torah, which I expect you've heard. And it is indeed most commonly translated law, but that has some problems with it because when we hear the word law, we start shifting into judicial mode and uh, the idea of do this, this is your punishment. And that's not exactly what we're talking about here, as we'll see in just a minute. Most commonly, when the word Torah is in the scripture, it's referring to the first five books of the Bible. The books of Moses, the law, uh, sometimes called the five pieces, or in Greek, that's Pentateuch. And so... That, that's the part that's most commonly referred to, but it's not necessarily that because sometimes it refers to it as the written law, those five books, plus the oral law, which developed over centuries and was ultimately, after Jesus, written down as well. But the combination of the oral law and the written law is sometimes referred to as the law, the Torah. And there's another meaning yet uh, beyond that, and it's broader still. And it has to do with instructions for life. How are you going to live your life? And that is the guidance that's being given here. And this brings us back to the question about the hornet nest. When somebody, and whether it was your mother or your camp counselor or your squad leader, whoever it was, said, don't touch the hornet nest. What are we going to call that? that? Is that a commandment? Is that a law? Is that teaching? Is that instruction? Is that suggestion for lifestyle choice? What is that? Y'all, y'all pondered it. What, what resonated with you? Wisdom, yeah, there, there is some wisdom in that. And uh, we can ignore it, right? Uh, in a very famous chapter of the Bible, in Proverbs chapter 3, it begins 
my son, do not forget my teaching. It's a chapter about wisdom. And that word teaching there is Torah. It's back again. But it's not referring to five books of the Bible or the, the five books plus an oral tradition. It's referring to the idea of instruction and guidance. And so when the text here says we're talking about the book of the law, we're talking about a written record of instructions. And it's better you probably think about it as a written record than a book because they were more than likely not having rectangular pages bound on one side with a hard cover. Um, it was most likely a scroll and not what we would call a book, but it is the record of instructions that they have received from God through Moses. And so these instructions are um, the, the teaching, the wisdom, the, the living life, uh, how a new nation under the sun is going to embody the wisdom of the maker of the whole world. How are you going to live to show the world what is the proper way to live? And so it's not so much crime and punishment when we talk about the law. It's more like the operator's manual. So when you get your car and there's a manual with it and it says use this certain kind of motor oil and change it every so often, you can ignore that, right? Sure. You can ignore that and the maker's guidance to you and it's going to bring grief. Ultimately, you may lose your engine. And so it is with God's instructions for living. There are certain things that God says, don't touch it, don't poke it with a stick, don't throw rocks at it, don't even come close to it. Somebody's going to get hurt, and you included. Don't touch the hornet's nest, right? Adultery, somebody's going to get hurt. Stealing, somebody's going to get hurt, and you're going to be one of those somebodies. All right, so there's this guidance for how we're going to live. And we can choose to, choose to ignore it and suffer the consequences. But it's more than just a collection of commandments. The Jewish scholars carefully read through the word. They counted them up. They said there's 248 you shall and 365 you shall not for a total of 613 commandments. Okay, and then one of them thought he'd ask Jesus a question. He says, which one's the most important? And Jesus said, the greatest of the commandments is to love God. To love God with all your heart and soul and mind. All that you are, that's the most important thing. That's the greatest commandment. That is a commandment in Deuteronomy 6.5 if you want to look it up. And then Jesus said, and the second one is all like it. It's love your neighbor as yourself. And that came from Leviticus, and that came from the reading we saw earlier that went with the devotional about helping a neighbor move a fence. So there it is. Jesus has summed up the law, all 613 commandments and other stuff, narratives around it, where it came from. And it boils down to love God Love other people. And then if that weren't clear enough, Jesus said at the Last Supper, when he had his disciples there, a new commandment I give to you. And I know y'all have heard this one. He says, I, a new commandment I give you. And what was that? Love one another. Just to be clear, he's going to emphasize it because he's about to leave them. So the law has its uses. It can be a model for good behavior. It can be a deterrent to bad behavior. It can convict us 
of our falling short of what God wants us to be, convict us of our sin, and therefore our need for a Savior. So it has its use, but it cannot save. And so its end is to point to the one who can save. That is to Jesus Christ who is the fulfillment of all these things being worked out in Scripture through Joshua. Now, what it says to do with the law is that it should never depart from your mouth. That's what Joshua was told. So I think to some extent that says to our leaders, you need to be able to teach. You need to be able to speak out the words that God has given it. You need to be able to explain them to people. You need to read it and study it for yourself. You need to be conversant about it. You need to converse using God's word. And if we examine ourselves and think that, oh, good, I'm off the hook. I'm not a leader of any sort. Well, I don't think we're quite understanding the situation because you can be a leader in a family. You can be a leader on a sports team. You can be the leader of a small group. You can be the leader of a nation. And if you are a Christian, who is going to lead unbelievers to Christ except you, a leader? Every Christian is a leader. And I believe it is the duty for each of us to be conversant with the law. Now it says, meditate on it day or night. And meditate is another word that has probably uh, some connotations that might throw us off. Because today, we might have a tendency to think this has something to do with the meditation of Eastern religions. It has something to do with postures and mantras and emptying oneself and so on. Well, it could have something to do with emptying oneself, but only that one be filled with the object of meditation. And this verse says that meditation has an object, and that is the word, meditate on the word, day and night. And the word in Hebrew, we've heard it before. Jeff has told us about it. It's the word hagah. He gave us this image of lion making noise and growling over its prey. Uh, as it was about to chew something up. Um, It is a word that means to make a noise. It means to speak to oneself, something like that, to murmur, to mutter, uh, to say something uh, um, as you're pondering, especially. I saw one place that was translated to, to soliloquize. Now, the only soliloquies I'm familiar with are where a character in a play is speaking out loud, Uh, so that the audience can hear what's in his head while he's pondering something like the Prince of Denmark is saying, to be or not to be, that is the question. All right, he's talking to himself. He's talking himself through something. He's pondering what he's going to do. And that's the kind of meditation that we're talking about here. We're looking at the Word. We're going through it in our head. We're saying, what does it mean to me? What am I going to do with it? Now, Jeff has shared with me that he recommends the three S's, that we have some silence, solitude, and stillness. Now, accomplishing any of those, and especially all of those in themselves, is a big thing. But that's not the end. The reason you want those three S's in your life is so that you can focus on the Word. And this doesn't happen just by chance. It takes some work. It takes some effort and discipline on our part. It takes some scheduling. It takes having a place to do it. We need to be careful about it, or we just won't include that in our life because it's so easy not to. We need a time of reflection on the Word in our own lives. What we need to do is to make the written Word, the Torah, God's Word to us. And how are we going to do about that? How are we going to do that? But to think about those words and say, what does this say about God? What does this say about people? What does this say about me and God? 
and consider those things. Because we can get rusty and saying, oh yeah, I read that 55 years ago. Um, you know, the word needs to spring fresh in you all the time. You need, you need to keep reading it. It's a lifetime occupation. We're never going to get to the point where we say, I got that down. I don't need to read it anymore. I don't need to study it anymore. We're never going to get there. We need to apply it. So that's what sermons are about. We're going to apply this that we've just heard. And so we, like Joshua, have been commissioned for a job. And we heard this last week in the first of the series. We have received the great commission from our Lord. And he said, go. And he said, make disciples. And he said, baptize. And he said, teach. And what did he say? Teach. Teach them to obey all I have commanded. Okay? That's our, that's our commission. And how are we going to be successful at it? We're going to ground ourselves in God's word and have it move us to obedient action. It is a pillar of our vision for this church. We need to come out of the wilderness and enter into the rich inheritance that God has prepared for us. You may not know about the meaning of the word Jesus. We sang what a beautiful name it is. And it connects to the meaning of the word Joshua. It's actually the same name. Joshua's name at one point, the name given by his parents was Hosea, which means salvation. And Moses gave him a new name. He said, your name will be Yehoshua, which means God is salvation. And once you run Yehoshua through the ringer of Greek language, as the New Testament is written in, it comes out of Jesus which is Jesus. And so when we read in the New Testament, Joshua or Jesus, it's the same name. It just got translated one way or the other based on its context. So Jesus is our Joshua. And he has led us out of the wilderness. And he has defeated our enemies. And he has led us into the land of rest. And now we need to be about the business of his commands. And how are we going to know what they are? We need to be hearer, we need to be doers and not just hearers. I know in the word class, we've been studying Luke. Jesus was on this multiple times, right? He says, don't just listen to it. You've got to put it into action in your life. Not in your heads in assent. Oh yeah, I agree with that. That's like me in calculus class. And the instructor's up there, put fill in the blackboard, and I'm going, yeah, that makes sense. But when I got tested on it, where did it go? It may have made sense, but it wasn't built into my life, and it was gone. <laughs> so, we have got the command to love God, to love our neighbor as ourself, and to love one another. And that's a big job. That takes some perseverance. That takes some patience. That takes some grace. That takes uh, a lot of effort on our part. Living out our faith in our community, just like Israel living out their faith in the land of Canaan, we're a part of that stream of themes that goes through the scripture. God told Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Moses and then Joshua, don't be afraid, I'm with you. And our Lord Jesus tells us in the Great Commission the very same thing. That's how it ends, right? For I am with you even to the end of the age. Thank God. Let's have a quick prayer together. Dear Heavenly Father, we pray 
that as we get into your word and see the richness of the promises there and lay, lay claim to them for ourselves, that we would be able to put into practice those things we've nodded our head to. Yes, Lord, we believe that's the right thing, but Lord, give us the strength to put it into effect in our own life, to stick out the course, to be patient with one another, to treat people with respect, and all those other parts of the law that our Lord has summed up as to love one another. We pray that you would give us the strength and the courage to do that. Amen.